Peace and joy. That's going to be a great day. Amen. Wow. Been a blessing to be with you all the last few weeks. It was unexpected, but I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed being with you all, and uh, it's been very refreshing to be here. It's very refreshing just to sit in the pew with my family and hear the preaching, and uh, it's just been uh, just wonderful to reconnect with you all again. Uh, we will be leaving on the 19th, and so we're happy about that. And we'll be finally able to get to, back to Mexico. Everything's going very well there. Uh, they, uh, as I said, we have a mission now, and the mission had some of the best, uh, one of the best uh, attendances uh, ever. And so I'm thankful to hear about that, in spite of everything going on there. And uh, we saw uh, they saw someone saved. It, there was a couple that had been coming through the RU program. They started coming because they live where you would find people that really need it in RU. They live in Tepito, which is uh, it's uh, just like the Hell's Kitchen of Mexico City. It's really bad off area. And they would like to start, we would, with them, would like to see a uh, mission, sort of like a street mission started there. And uh, their son, who's unsaved, uh, has been coming with them to church. Uh, they have several sons that have been coming, grown sons that have been coming. And uh, Ivan got saved this last Sunday, so we're thankful about that. So good things are happening there. They're right now in what they call uh, a red light. Uh, they're, they got red light, yellow light. You know, red's the worst for COVID. And then you got yellow. Uh, I think it's orange and yellow. Some of, them are, some of the states are going into orange, which means they're actually going to allow people to go to church. Amen? 50% capacity. And, uh, and, uh, but we're still in red. They say that uh, by the 28th, we should be in yellow and then we'll be able to go to church. Well, we're already going to church, but uh, and they're going to let people actually go to church, 50% capacity. So we'll, uh, let, uh, we'll see what happens then. But just pray for that and pray for uh, some of our people in our church. They've gotten the COVID, and we've got like four people, I think, right now. Altogether, we've had seven people that have been tested positive there. But you're in a city, so you can just imagine uh, it's a lot easier to get it there. But just uh, pray for them. There's one that's uh, a lady who's really worried about it. She has asthma and things, and she just uh, asked us to pray for her. Her name is Martha. Uh, so that's an update of what's going on. Uh, pray for, uh, like I said, we'd like to start a mission. Uh, really, it's uh, two things this fall uh, where that place is in Tepito. Uh, we'd like to start having service, uh, like our RU program right there, just bring people in the street and uh, just uh, and teach them there uh, the Bible and see them saved and witness to them. And, but also there's a mission near the airport that's about 20 minutes from there. We'd like to start a mission there that would become a church. And then the people that we see reached in the RU program, they could go there to church. Uh, it's a lot closer. It would be a lot closer there than coming all the way to where we're at. So just uh, pray for the, that. Uh, God will give me wisdom when to start that. We wanted to start this June, but uh, things got delayed, and it'll probably be sometime in the fall. Turn on with your Bibles, please, to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Um, in my Sunday morning services online, <laughs> I've been preaching uh, uh, several messages. I was doing it in person when I was there uh, from Second Chronicles 7. It has a lot to do with what's going on today. And uh, we've been just looking at our responsibility if we want to see our land, and not just uh, healed uh, physically, but spiritually, to see revival in our in our land, whether it be Mexico or Mexico or, or, or here in the States. It says here in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 13, If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their land, or forgive their sin, and will heal their land. I want to focus on where it says, uh, I, I preached a series of messages looking at each one of these um, phrases of our responsibility, and I want to look at where it says, and seek my face, and seek my face. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for uh, good service that we had this morning. Lord, I thank you for the privilege of being here in my home church. I don't just consider it my sending church, but my home church. And Lord, I thank for all the people here that are praying for us and giving so that we can be there and uh, be extended ministry at Fairy Haven Baptist Church in Mexico City. Lord, I thank for uh, the time we've had here, the good weather that we've been able to enjoy. And Lord, I pray that you just uh, help this message draw uh, people to you. And Lord, uh, help us to have a stronger walk with you. 
in a closer walk with you, and, and, uh, and that we may be cleaner, that we may be holier, and that we may even be more powerful in, in our walk in, and in reaching this world for you. And Lord, I pray that you just give me words to say. Lord, I pray that you would uh, guide my thoughts. And Lord, I pray that you would, above all, give me power to preach. I pray these things in your name. Amen. Uh, I want to start, as an introduction, talking about seeking God's face. Um, Several times in the Bible, not just here, but in many, time, many parts of the Bible, we are uh, um, motivated by the Scriptures to seek God's face. But what does that actually mean when it says seek God's face? You know, we can't really see the face of God. Uh, there's Scripture that says if we would see the face of God, we would die. In fact, he's spirit, so it would be hard to really see his face anyhow. Uh, but what does it mean to seek the face of God? Well, the Hebrew word for face in the Old Testament uh, sometimes is translated presence. So it's not really talking about seeking the face of God, but seeking the presence of God. We can't seek his face literally, but we can seek his presence. And uh, we can seek his presence, and he calls us to seek his presence. God wants us to seek his presence. The face of a person reveals many times his character, and his personality. Uh, I, I, seem, I, I think of myself as being a pretty good judge of character. I've been able to, uh, just looking at a person, uh, see what kind of a person it is. And many times I'm right. Sometimes I've been fooled. Sometimes there'll be a person that looks really nice, a nice guy, and he can be pretty mean. And then there's other people that you uh, think are pretty haughty, and then you find out they're uh, actually not that way. And uh, but a lot of times we can see somebody and really tell what kind of person they are, whether they're a haughty person, whether they're a humble person, whether they're a frustrated person, whether they're a, a, a person that uh, uh, is, is egotistical, just thinks of themselves, or a giving person. And a lot of times we can just tell by their face. A face many times represents uh, their character, their personality. Um, we can see a lot of times their internal emotions as well. Uh, by their expressions that are on their face. As again, once again, whether they're worried, whether they're frustrated, whether they're mad, whether they're irritated, a lot of times we can see uh, what's going on inside from what's going on in their face. Uh, we recognize in a, per, a person just by looking at their face, we know who they are. Uh, we can tell uh, the difference between each, each other by looking at each other's face. And so really the face represents the complete person. When I think of a person, I, I'm not thinking about their pinky. I'm not visualizing their big toe. I'm not uh, thinking of their belly button, amen? I'm thinking of their face. Uh, that's what we, when we consider a person, we consider we're looking at their face. And so that represents the entire person. Uh, when we think of uh, a person, we think of their face. And the writers in the Bible as well, uh, when they talk about the human face, uh, they rep it represents the whole person. Um, and so we are called, and many times in the Bible, uh, the children of Israel were called to seek the presence of God. Many times because they had abandoned God and needed to return to God. Uh, we call that idolatry, and they were guilty of that many times. And many times when they would get, go astray and worship idols, God would call them to seek his face again. Talking about idolatry, let's look what the Bible says about that. You say, well, Pastor, uh, you know, we're, we're uh, now Christians in the modern age. Uh, that doesn't really pertain to us. Well, let's see. Turn with me to Galatians. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. I think I, there's a lot of idolatry going on. And not just in places like Mexico or the third world. There's idolatry going on right here in America and even in churches. Galatians chapter 5 speaks of the sins and works of the flesh, of the fleshly Christian, of the carnal Christian. Let's take a look at the list of these. It says in verse 17, for the lust, the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary, the one to the other, so that we, that ye, cannot do the things that ye would. Now, Paul is writing to Christians. He's writing to the Christians of the churches of Galatia. So he's talking to Christians, and he's talking about carnal Christians. He says the word ye, so he's not talking about the unsaved. He's talking about Christians. 
He says in verse 18, But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery. Can Christians commit adultery? Yes, they can. Fornication. Yes, they do many times. Uh, uncleanness. Yes, I know a lot of unclean Christians. Lasciviousness. Yes. It talks about witchcraft. I guess they could even fall into witchcraft. Hatred. Oh, there's a lot of that going on in Families of Christians, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings. Oh, there's a lot of that in churches today. Uh, there could even be murder. But look what I left out, and I left it out on purpose. It says in verse 20, the first word, idolatry. Can a Christian be idolatrous? Oh, yes, he can. Oh, yes, he can. The Bible sure says he can. Turn with me, please, to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. The Bible says here, Mortify therefore, it's talking to Christians of course, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, we saw that back there in Galatians. Uncleanness, same thing. Inordinate affection, evil concu uh, concu uh, I'm trying to say it in Spanish, sorry. Evil uh, concupiscence, I know I'm saying it wrong. Okay, uh, and covetousness, which is idolatry. That's the sin, and I've heard it preached even here, that's the sin of American Christians today, amen? Covetousness, wanting more stuff, more money, living for money. You know, we say we love God, and we do love God, but boy, isn't it easy to live for money. Isn't it easy to live for things, especially here in America, but even in Mexico? Mexican Christians, they live for money. They make decisions based on money, on the accumulation of wealth, many times to the detriment of their spiritual walk with God and their, obedient, and their obedience to God. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. We see the same thing in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. Paul even calls... Christians here are idolatrous. Ephesians 5, 5. For this you know that no whoremonger nor unclean person, again, we're talking to Christians. We saw this in Galatians. We saw this in Col Colossians. And it says, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath not inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. In fact, it says the same thing in Galatians, that those who are, do these things... Uh, will not inherit the kingdom of God. What it's saying is, when we do these things, we're just like the unsaved. Carnal Christians are like the unsaved. You know, we're just sinners saved by grace, and we can be just as carnal as any unsaved person, and we can be just as covetous as any unsaved person. The Bible says that's idolatry because we're putting, when we put money, mammon, before God, when we serve, the Bible says we can only serve one or the other, so every time we serve mammon, we're not serving God. When we put mammon first in our decisions, then we're covetous and we're idolatrous. And many times that goes with discontentment as well. We're discontented. We think we need to have more. The billboard's saying that we need to have this or that. Uh, the television, the commercials say, the radio even. When you listen to talk radio, I mean, if you were doing everything a talk radio commercial said, you'd have this kind of pillow, amen? You'd have this kind of mattress. You'd have uh, this and that. You'd have everything. I remember one time I was talking to a fellow in Milwaukee, and he had, had khaki pants because Glenn Beck hey, wears khaki pants. You know, he was promoting it, and so he bought a pair, and no, even though he couldn't afford it, just because somebody said it. And that happens so many times. We buy things, we get ourselves in debt because we got to have what everyone's saying that we have to have, and we're discontent because we don't have it. The accumulation of wealth, there's nothing wrong with wealth when God gives us wealth. But when we live for wealth and put aside the things of God to pursue wealth and make decisions about where we're going to live, even though there's not a place to serve God where, where, where we can make some more money, we got a problem there. That's called idolatry. When we live just for comfort, when we make our decisions on how comfortable we can be. Boy, how people get busy on Saturday when it's time to serve God. Oh, they, all of a sudden there's a ton of things to do. I don't, uh, how many times, uh, you know, we can have a teen activity. Now I can have a long, uh, I can uh, say, we're going to go to Six Flags. There is a Six Flags in Mexico. And, uh, uh, and I'll have the list full on the front, full in the back with names. Even uh, when there's no more room, they'll be putting it on the side, upside down, and everything to get their name on that piece of paper. 
But then a couple Saturdays later, we're going to go to the old folks' home. Well, where are all those young people that had so much time on their hands? And now they're so busy. Now they've got homework to do and so many things now that they, you know, I've got to go mow the lawn. And it's because a lot of people live for pleasure and give money to, for pleasure. Then they don't have money to give to God. But I don't think that's so much of a problem. It can be a problem. Maybe it is a problem if maybe God's speak, spoken your heart about it. But I don't think that's so much the problem with Fairhaven Baptist Christians. Maybe with a lot of Christians uh, ar around America and in Mexico. Maybe it could be you, maybe not. But I think uh, this second point will speak to us more. God not only wants us to seek his presence, he wants us to seek him always. He wants us to seek him always. Turn with me to Psalm 105, verse 4. Psalm 105, verse Verse 4 it says here, Seek ye the Lord and his strength. Oh, how we need his strength. How weak we are. Seek his face evermore. God calls us to seek his face evermore. And when we aren't seeking his face always, that's when we, with good intentions even, Wanting to be good Christians, get ourselves tripped up. A lot of times we find ourselves in the flesh. A lot of times we find us doing things that we don't really want to do, but we do it anyhow. You know, that great struggle. And we find ourselves doing things we shouldn't be doing and not doing things that we should do. And the cause of it all is because we're not seeking Him always. Maybe we haven't abandoned God like many Christians do. Maybe we're uh, more serious about things of God than the average Christian. But there are moments when we are careless in pursuing God. We get involved in the things of our life. We get involved in the day-to-day in, in uh, uh, -day tasks, and we forget about God. I know we have to have our mind on what we're doing. I'm not saying we just uh, forget, uh, don't put our mind on what we're doing. But many times we have times where we uh, could be concentrating on God and we're not. We're concentrating on the next thing to do. We're not giving thankful thanks to God for helping us with the task we just finished. We forget about God because we're so busy with the things we have to do. And pretty soon well, we find ourselves saying things that we shouldn't say and doing things we shouldn't do because we don't have the mind of God. We have the mind of Clint Reardon. We have the mind of ourselves. And pretty soon we're thinking in the flesh. We're not thinking in a way God would have us to think. We're not thinking spiritually. And then we get ourselves into trouble and we make bad decisions. The face of God, his sacred character, many times is obscured, is darkened by our human condition, by our carnal desires. That's why a lot of times we just need to stop and we need to think, we need to meditate. We need to remember what we're doing, where we are, and that God is with us and wants us to put our eyes on him, focus on him. That's why sometimes we even need to get rid of some of those, uh, put away some of those items. Sometimes we need to fast, and sometimes we just need to get alone with God, and we need to put our eyes on him because we have gotten, become distracted with so many things. It's because of that that God insists that we seek his face continually. Turn with me to Proverbs. This is my favorite passage in all the Old Testament. It's been my favorite passage for years. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. It says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Many times we find ourselves leaning on our own understanding like, <laughs> Uh, Pastor Devin preached not too long, long ago, I got this. You know, I'm, I've been saved for 45 years. Personally, I've been saved 45 years. I've got this. I know what to do. How many times we think that? Uh, we've got this ha handled, you know. Uh, I might not have read my Bible as much as I should uh, this morning, but I'll, I'll make up for it tomorrow. You know, we'll get up late, maybe. I don't know. Uh, how, how you live, but, uh, and you just don't spend the time with God, or you don't spend the time meditating in God. Maybe you read a little bit uh, of what uh, your, your schedule, reading schedule is, but you just didn't have time. That's dangerous. 
That's dangerous. You, we pre pretty soon we're taking our eyes of God from, off of God, and that's a bad way to start the day. And sometimes we have a good devotional time, but then we go off in the rush of the day and we forget about God the rest of the day. The Bible says here, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. That's the secret of the Christian life. In all thy ways acknowledge him, recognize him. The Bible calls uh, the Spirit of God uh, our, our, our paraclete, or that's in the, the Greek word for our comforter. He's always at our side, but how many times we just ignore him, we forget about him, we forget about our need, our desperate need for him. In all thy ways acknowledge him. And he shall direct thy paths. Oh, how many times our paths are crooked. The things that we say, even the things that we're thinking, even the attitudes that we have are crooked because our eyes are not, our mind is not stayed on him. It's stayed on other things. It's stayed on the circumstances, the adversities, the things that are irritating us. Oh, when, it, when you get pressured with the external pressure of irritation, that's when you need to put your eyes on God. Because pretty soon you're going to be saying things you shouldn't be saying, and doing things you shouldn't be doing. You know, when we feel self-pity, well, ooh, watch out. That's when it's time to turn your eyes on God, because pretty soon you're going to be doing things that you deserve instead of what you should be doing. God desires to be our constant companion in this experience called life. Many times we don't have time for him. He wants us to know him from beginning to end. And what we preach in RU and teach in RU is when we were saved, God knew us. Amen? And remember when to the unsaved, God's going to say, Christ is going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. But he knows us. Once we're saved, he knows us very well. But we don't know him that well when we're first saved. And the Christian life, the rest of our Christian life is getting to know him more and more. That's what the Bible says in 1 Peter 3.18, isn't it? Grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what basically life should be all about, is getting to know him more and more. Oh, when we put that as our emphasis instead of what we do for God, we'll be a more powerful Christians. We'll be better at what we're doing for God. When we put that first before all, the Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 8, James chapter 4, verse 8, James chapter 4, verse 8, you want to be a better bus captain, put your emphasis, not on your, how many, not on your goal, although that's good to have a goal, put your emphasis that week in knowing God, and being what God wants you to be, and loving him, and he, you will, and doing what, he, and being obedient, not in just your actions, but in your thoughts and in your attitudes, and how that can change that bus route where you're working on. James chapter four verse eight says, "Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify you, your hearts, ye double-minded. Put your mind on God. Take your mind off the things that are distracting you from Him." Well, when we get close to God in prayer, that's seeking his face. And oh, how he wants us to seek his face. Turn with me to Psalm 27. Pardon me, but uh, I read a lot of the scriptures because I don't have anything to say, but God has a lot to say. Proverbs 27, verse 8. Oh, I love this. Call from God to man, to us worms. When thou saidst, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Oh, God's always saying that to us. Seek ye my face. Hey, you got problems? You're frustrated? Things aren't going right? Seek ye my face. Put your eyes back on me. Not on the winds and ways of circumstances. Put your eyes on me. When you're tempted with pleasure or with things of this world that could distract you from me. Put your eyes on me again. Take your eyes off the things of this world that really are temporary anyhow. Put your eyes on the eternal. Oh, when David heard these words that God was inviting him to seek him, he said, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. No wonder 
David, with all his, with all his uh, weaknesses, no wonder God called him the man after his own heart. Amen. <laughs> he sought for God. He made mistakes just like us, but he sought God. The Bible says in Jeremiah 29, 13, great promise. I love reading these promises. Jeremiah 29, verse 13. And ye shall seek me and find me. And ye shall search for me with all your heart. Wow. He can be found. We can have his presence, know his presence, feel his presence. Know that everything's going to be okay. Know that we can speak and God can use what we have to say to lead others to Christ. It's exciting. But it happens when we seek him. If we don't seek him, we won't find him. We'll be lost in the dark. We'll be afraid. We'll be afraid to tell others about Christ. We'll be afraid about the circumstances that are happening in our lives. We need to seek him. A lot of times God brings crisis and sickness to our lives to get us to look above. How many times over the last few years and even the last few weeks and months we've seen people, uh, Christians, friends of ours, flat on their backs in a hospital. God wants to use that for them to look up. And if you've been in a hospital, you know what I'm talking about. There's no other place to look but up. God wants us to put us down so that we have to look up. Oh, how we need to take advantage of that. Now, how we've seen people who've been in that situation, we go and we visit them trying to be a blessing to them and a whole how when they have learned to look up, they've been a blessing to us. Amen? I think of people like Mrs. Goss and others. Wow, how they even how they even touched the lives of nurses and doctors because God was with them and they only had to, they could only look up when they could only look up. God wants us to convert our hearts, bring, uh, uh, to, to bring our hearts to him, turn our hearts to him. Uh, like it says in Malachi 4, 6, we're not going to look at it, but we know the verse the Bible talks about the Elias would come, that the, the, the prophet would come, and John the Baptist did come. And the Bible says that the hearts of the children would be turned to their fathers. We have a father. It's called our Heavenly Father. And God wants us, in time of revival, he will bring our hearts to him to look to him. You don't have to wait for revival to do that, a mass revival. You can have revival in your heart right now. Look to him. In fact, in Luke 1, 17, it has that same verse in Malachi, but it's even more appropriate, I think, to, for us because it talks about turning the, 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 the heart of the disobedient, isn't that us? The heart of the disobedient to the just, the just God. Turn our heart, we need to turn our hearts to him. The true nature of worship is seeking his face. The Christian walk is a life dedicated to seeking his presence. Seeking his favor as well, God's favor. The Lord wants us to look, seek his face with humility. In fact, that's the only way you can look and seek him. We need to humble ourselves. Those who are not humble think they, like we heard, they've got it. They're fine. You know, I, I, I can skip. The Bible. I, I can skip my Bible study. I can skip prayer. I can skip maybe one service because, after all, I, I've been a, I've, I've been a Christian for a long time. No, we desperately need God, and we need to realize our, in, in our humility, I can't do anything without him. We need to trust him with all our hearts, with all our prayers, and in our time in the word of God. Turn with me, please, to Psalm 10. Psalm 10, this is an interesting verse here. Psalm chapter 10, where is, there's no Psalm chapter 10, I'm sorry, uh, Bible scholars, it's Psalm 10. Psalm 10 verse 4 says, The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. We as Christians sometimes can be pretty wicked. <laughs> we can be proud and put our eyes on other things instead of on God. The Bible says that we need to be seeking him in all of our thoughts. You say, that's impossible. Look what it says, the pride. Pride of his countenance. That reminds me of the latest scenes. 
We have need of nothing. We've got this. I know what to do. In every, I know how to raise my kids. I know what to do in temptation. I'll be all right. No, we need to seek after God. We need to have him in all of our thoughts. Uh, F.B. Meyer, uh, when he was teaching on this, uh, I call it, I just named what he taught, but he taught about the fault, uh, a focus, a default focus. You know, we can't always be thinking, uh, meditating, meditating, meditating on God. I know a lot of times we've got to focus on what we're doing on our job, and, and then we, got, we go from one to the other, and then we've we got, we got our agenda, we've got our list of things to do, and we're doing them. But what do we do when, we're, when, when we got the job done? How about if we thank God for getting the job done, amen? That'd be a good start. But when we go on to the next place, and we've got to go from here to there, from A to B, like I say to our people on our bus, a lot of them uh, in our church, a lot of them have to take buses. What are you doing on that bus? Just shaking the air as the bus goes down the road? Why don't you think about God, amen? Maybe if, while you're thinking about God, you'll think about the souls around you and you'll hand out a track or something. Yes. When you're sh we, we can think about God while we're shaving, amen? While you're putting on your makeup, amen? Okay. You can do it while you're driving. Don't pray with your eyes closed, but you can be thinking about God, amen? I mean, there's a lot of times when we could be talking to God, having fellowship with God, spending time with God. Put away that smartphone. Put away that video game. Oh, I have nothing to do, so my default is to go to the video game, young person. Why don't you seek God? Oh, some of the best times I had as a teenager. We lived, uh, we had eight people in our family. Nine when Grandma lived with us for a while. I remember sleeping with Grandma. Because we had a house of two bedrooms, eight kids. No, six kids. Uh, and I, we had kids everywhere. We had kids in, sleeping on the couch. We had kids sleeping in the bedroom. We had, my dad made a, a, a room in the attic. And, we, you know, you could go in there to your bedroom. Amen. <laughs> Uh, I, remember when I, I remember when I finally was able to make it to the attic, from the room to the attic, because my other kids, uh, my, my brothers and sisters moved to the garage. Yeah, plywood, plywood garage uh, bedrooms. But man, in that plywood garage, it was cold in the winter. We, we, we trade heaters, you know, five hours here, five hours there. It was hot in the summer, but boy, what good times I had in that bedroom in the garage. Spend the time with God. We, didn't, we couldn't afford Atari. Amen. Remember Atari? The television? What was the other one? Uh, I can't remember all of them. You know, we had, oh, we had, it's called Odyssey. All it was was Pong. Remember Pong? Just, just that stripe, those two things. Okay, this was a neat thing. You, you had this plastic thing you'd put on the television. Okay, you want to play hockey? There's hockey. You want to play tennis? There's tennis. But all it was was mm, Pong, you know. So... I think, but I thank God that we didn't have all the distractions, young people, because I could spend time there in that bedroom, plywood bedroom, on my knees, reading the Word of God. I wouldn't be in Mexico if it wasn't for those times. I wouldn't have known the God, will of God if it wasn't for those times. I think there's a lot of young people, they don't, they don't know what they want to do. They don't know what the will of God is because they don't spend time with God. Well, they may read the Bible because their parents tell them to read the Bible. They may pray and go to all uh, teen activities and everything. But are you really seeking God, young person? What do you do in your off time when you have, when you, when you have all your chores are done? I, I'm not, there's nothing wrong with seeing your friends and talking to your friends. My son has friends. You know, he plays basketball with them and things like that, church friends. But if... I think there's a lot of young people, they don't know what the will of God is and, and because they're not really, they don't know God. Oh, they're saved, they're on their way to heaven, and they're good kids, but they never really learn to spend time with God. They really get to know him. Oh, I, I still have teardrops in my Bible. I'm not trying to be trite or anything, but God moved in my life when I spent time with him. And that's why I'm here, and that's why I'm in Mexico. Because I learned to love him and learn his love, spending time with him. My favorite passage in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 14, 
chapter 5, 14 and 15. It's my life verse, my life passage verse. Because this is, I guess, what I am and who I am, and I wouldn't be, if it wasn't for these verses, I wouldn't be who I am. For the love of Christ constraineth us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. The love of Christ constrains me. That's why I'm in Mexico. That's why I went off to Bible college. That's why I said, God, whatever you want me to do with my life, I'm willing to do. And that's why I sought him to find out what he wanted me to do. Because I didn't want to mess up. I don't want to mess up the lives of others either. The love of Christ constrains us, and because of that, they that live should not live unto themselves. It's not what you want. Life's not all, all about you. You wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for him. So we heard, uh, someone, I think Pastor Dameron say today, or someone said, we live for his pleasure. You know, they say that in Chick-fil-A, my pleasure, you know. Really, my pleasure should be his pleasure. His pleasure should be my pleasure. That's why we're here. That's why you're, you wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for him. You know, the, our will in the world wants to pull us from God. It's always pulling us from God. It's like, you know, God is the son of right. Jesus is mentioned as the son of righteousness in the Bible. He's the son. He should be the sin of our lives, and all of our lives should center around him. But we're pulled, you know, the world is like that centrifugal force that's pulling us away from him. But praise God, his, the gravity of his love pulls us towards him. The Bible says that we are drawn with his everlasting cords of love. But you won't know that love if you're not seeking him. All the rules of this church as some people call them, rules. In college and school will just be rules if you don't learn to love God, if you don't seek him. Man, when I came to Bible college, I heard about all those rules, and I thought, well, I've been living that all my life. That's not hard, but some, for some people, it's so hard, it's so complicated to, to obey them. Just learn to love God, and they were easy because they're really just what every good Christian ought to do. Because Jesus, after all, is a source of all graces, amen? Everything we have, that Father of lights, God, from which all perfect and wonderful gifts come from, that you have received, that I have received, come from him. Why don't we put our eyes on him then? <laughs> He's a source of our strength. Just like the sun is a source of our, uh, of our light, he's a source of our gu to guide us, he's a source of our, of our life. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him. He sustains all things. All things were made by him and for him, not for us. But he also gives us his strength. And that's so many times where we fail. We, we say we're weak, and we are weak. And we say, well, I fell again, and I fell again. Well, why, why do we fall? Because we don't have our eyes on him. Because we're weak. And then when in the pride of our countenance, like we saw there in Psalm 10, in the pride of our countenance, we, we, we neglect to have him in our thoughts. That's when we fall. Then we wonder, what happened? Well, duh. Put your eyes on him. And keep your eyes on him. And when you're involved with something, go on the next. I remember one time I was in, at church all by myself, and I got done with my task I was doing. I said, God, what do you want? A lot of times I, do, I say this, God, what do you want me to do next? Because maybe I don't have it on a list of things to do. One time he said, make a cup of coffee, amen? <laughs> so I made myself a cup of coffee. I mean, it might have been me, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> hey, I, I had everything done, and I asked God, and that's what came to my mind. So, but that should be our life. What do you want me to do next, God? Talk to God. He's with you. He's your paraclete. He's your count. Uh, he's right there. And maybe if you're saying, well, I'm too busy. I got so many interactions with, with people. Well, maybe you need to get away sometime. Let's get away. Seek God. Turn, turn with me to Psalm 63. Psalm 63. Psalm 63. Verses 1 through 3. O oh God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no God is. Young person, teenager, college students, when is the last time you've experienced this? 
If you've never experienced it, it's time to start experiencing it. It's time to thirst after God. It's time to seek him, to see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. You know why people, some people, it seems like, man, God's just prospering them spiritually. They're, they're, being, they're effective in the ministry. And others aren't. I think a lot of that has to do with seeking God. I really do. I know there's times in the ministry, I, I'm, not, I'm not talking about pastors, I'm talking about bus captains, I'm talking about people who have individual ministries and churches. Maybe that's the difference between, what's, maybe in, in your route. Maybe you're, you're having a problem, I, I, I know, I, we're in COVID, so I, I know it's easy to say, let's say when it's not COVID, okay? <laughs> and what's the excuse then? And I know it's harder and harder and harder, I, I understand all that. But some people are in the same area that's hard, but they're seeing a success. There is something about the power of God that comes when we seek God. Because our loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise thee. You know, and, and it's not building a bus around. It's not building a ministry. Life, you know, uh, in the Westminster short, the short confession, catechism, it says, and I believe this is true, or I wouldn't be re- quoting from them, but what is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is not to have the biggest bus route in, 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 in your church or the biggest bus ministry in America. What is, or the biggest church, or, or, or that best, biggest ministry, what is the chief end of man to glorify God and to enjoy him forever? Have you been enjoying him lately? Because that's why you're here on this earth. Now, now if you do that, guess what? You'll be a better bus captain, a better preacher, a better nursing home uh, worker, a best bus worker, a best junior church worker, a best junior church preacher and teacher. I, last year, I really wanted to teach our people to love God at the beginning of last year. And so I preached a lot of messages and taught a lot on just loving God. That, what is the greatest commandment? To love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And, and as I emphasized that, and I saw changes in our people. And I saw people who really learned to love God and really spend time with God. And in their ministries, I could see that they were more productive. They were more dedicated to God. They were more content in their life. They were more holy separated they also were more powerful and i could they they were seeing souls saved they were getting people out friends neighbors i think and even women were seeing their lives affect their kids think of one woman she had two rebellious teenagers she you know her husband was unsaved it's really hard to, you know, you're, she's trying to discipline him, and the dad says, no, I don't, you know, he doesn't understand. And it was a mess, and it was a, it was a battle. But she learned, started learning to love God. She became a powerful mother, a good mother, a consistent mother. She was making changes in her life, and her kids could see it. Now their son is begging his father to go to our Christian school. The daughter's already in a Christian school. He's in his last year. He just finished his second year, uh, second to last year of public school. He's witnessing to the teachers. He's witnessing to the professors. I can't, he's always in church. I can't get him away from the church. He's always, he's every, every excuse he can find to be there, he's there. He's not even in our school, but he comes for English class. And then he stays for chapel. Why? Because he has a mother who learned to love God and seek him with all her heart. Maybe you have some problem with some kids. Maybe they need to see someone who's seeking God with all his or her heart. Last of all, God wants us to seek his shining face. To seek his shining face. To have the face of God shining is an expression of a blessing of love and of the favor of God. Turn with me to Numbers. We're almost done. Numbers chapter 6. Numbers chapter 6. Oh, we need to have our mind on God, seeking him. They talk about people 
who have their minds so much on heavenly things that they are of no earthly good, I like to say there's a lot of Christians out there with a mind so much on earthly things that they're of no heavenly good. Numbers chapter 6. Numbers chapter 6. We're in verse uh, 25. I'll get there in a second. This is a blessing that Aaron would, was given by God, this blessing to, to give to the Israelites. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. So that was a uh, blessing that uh, Aaron would, with which Aaron would bless the children of Israel. But it talks about his face and it's combined with the blessings of God. Uh, turn with me to Psalm 80. And here we see the cry of people looking for revival, knowing that their heart is so uh, used to just uh, getting away from God, abandoning God, turning their face, uh, eyes on other things, whether it be money or whether it be uh, idols in their lives. But then they hear, uh, in fact, this is here uh, in my in my Bible, I got a Thompson chain that says, of the miseries of the church. Okay. Miseries brought on by uh, living a life for oneself, looking for uh, idols instead of looking for God. But then they cry out here in verse 3. They say it three times, and so it's emphasized, and it should call our attention. Turn us again, O God, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. Then he says in verse 7, the psalmist says here, the psalmist isn't even David, it's, a, it's Asaph. And he says here in verse 7, uh, Turn us again, O God of hosts. And cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. And then in verse 19, says the same thing. Turn us again, O Lord God of hosts. Cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. Cause thy face to shine in favor, uh, in, in blessing. We have turned from you, but we know if we'll just turn back to you, you will bless us again. If we just turn back to you, you will favor us again. But our heart is so, it, 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 it's, it, it's, I'm thinking of Spanish, the word, but it, it's so, what's the word for uh, traidor? It's traitorous, we could say, treacherous. That's a good word, treacherous. Our hearts are treacherous, and we know that. Once we think we're good, good Christians, and we, we're pretty good-hearted, then we see that our heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Perverse. Uh, selfish. And, he's, and this psalmist is saying, turn our selfish, treacherous hearts back to you because we need, desperately need your favor. Then we shall be saved. I love what it says in verse 18. So will not we go back from thee. Quicken us, revive us. And we will call upon thee. Especially we servants of God, love verse 17. Let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand, upon the son of man, whom thou made us strong for thyself. When we put our eyes on him, he makes us strong. Our weak flesh can become, uh, we can become strong because our eyes are on him. And he can bless us with his brilliant favor. We don't seek God for the things we can get from him. And I will close with this. We don't seek God uh, uh, just, uh, we may have a list of desires and there's nothing wrong with that and needs. But you know, that is not the reason why we should seek God. Uh, the only reason why we should seek God, because he knows what we need, doesn't he? The Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, verse 7 and 8, he knows all that we need, so we, we, we come to him basically not to let him know what we need, because he already knows what we need. It's so that we have our eyes on him saying, we trust you. We are looking to you. We are depending on you. That's what he loves. Matthew chapter 6, 7, and 8 says, But when we pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask them. He already knows what we need. We go to him because we're dependent on him. 
We go to him because we desperately need him. All of us love to be needed, amen? We love it when our child comes and, and asks things from us. You know, it depends on what it is. You know, if it's a, a 1960s Stingray Corvette, well, we're not too excited about giving that to them, amen? But, you know, when they want ice cream, and we, we love being needed. At least I do. And that, that's, you know, that's why the Bible says if you're a heavenly father, we love to give good gifts. We want to give good gifts to our children. We love it when they come to us because we, we, we see that they need us, that they love us, and, and, uh, and they come to us. They depend on us, and we, love, we like being dependent on At least I do. Matthew uh, 6, 32 and 33 says, For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly father knoweth that you have need of these things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. We should be seeking is not the things that can, we want to have added unto us, but his kingdom and his righteousness. Thirsting for his righteousness, uh, hungry for his righteousness, hungry for his holy character. Seeking the face of God means desiring to know his character, desiring him, his presence, more than the things that we could get from him. And I want to finish just looking at an il uh, illustration from the Bible, Exodus chapter 33 to really express what I'm trying to say. It's not the things that he gives us. It's not the favor that he shows us or the blessings, material blessings. It's him. It's him that we should want of all else. Here we know the story, those wicked Israelites with their treacherous hearts turned from God when Moses went up into Sinai. After 40 days, they said, we're going to have a feast to the Lord. And they had a jam session, like a lot of churches, amen? They're praising the Lord, but in the way that they learned from the world, they're in Egypt. And God comes down, and he says, they've corrupted themselves. And God is furious, just like I think he's furious with a few of those churches out there that worship God their own way. But here, now the Lord is furious with them. So furious. First of all, he wants to do away with him and create a new nation from Moses. But Moses uh, intervened, and, but God still was angry. And the Bible says here in Exodus 33, 1 through 4, And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land that I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, Unto thy seed will I give it. And I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzites, the Hivite, Hivites, the Jebusites, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. For I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff people, necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. He gave them sad, evil tidings, the Bible says in verse 4. He said, I'm going to let you go to the promised land. I'm going to let you go to the land of milk and honey. You're going to have so much food, you won't even know what to do with it. You're going to have houses that you haven't built. You're going to have vineyards that you haven't planted. You're going to be able to pick from trees that you haven't grown. You're going to be able to uh, 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 reap from fields that you haven't plowed. I'm going to give it all to you. But I'm not going with you. Now, these people that were so treacherous in mind and heart, at least they did something right. At least they recognized something right in verse 4. And when the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned. And so they should have. Because though they were offered the world to them, a country for themselves, defeated their enemies, God said, I'm not going to go with you. You do it on your own. Oh, that's the scariest thing that can be ever be heard. And Moses recognized that. In verse 12, Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast found grace in my sight. I've been close to you, God. You've been close to me. I've been in your presence. Now, therefore, I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. He, 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 he considered he equaled the grace of God with the presence of God because he found out that the, all graces come from his presence. Now, therefore, I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show, 
in thy sight. Show me now thy way that I may know that I may find grace in thy sight and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, my presence shall go with thee. The good news, and I will give thee rest. And he said, if thy, but, uh, and then he said, if I, and he said unto him, if thy presence go not with, go not with me, carry us not up hence. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not that thou goest with me, with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people of the face of the earth. How many people in the world have God with them? <laughs> well, today, every Christian, amen? amen? Back then, it was only the nation of Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight. I know thee by name. See, he could pray this way because he had a relationship with God. He was seeking God. He knew what it was to be in the presence of God. He could ask these things. But in verse 15, he says, If thy presence go not up with me, carry us not up hence. I do not want to go without your presence. You can have all the the houses there. You can have the, the fruit there and, and, and the success there. And, and uh, we don't want it if you're not with us. Oh, that we would say that today. Oh, covetous American Christian. That's what we need to say today. I'd ra- he, what he was saying is I'd rather be eating the dust here on the foot of Mount Horeb than have all the lands that I could have in a promised land if you're not with us. I'd rather be here having your presence here with me, eating dust, eating manna, not knowing, uh, just relying on you, not having, living in tents. I'd rather have that and have your presence than have all the cities and all the splendor and not have you. Oh, that, that'd be the heart of every Christian. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, forgive us of our idolatry if we've been idolatrous. Forgive us for putting our eyes and maybe making our lives comfortable for us, giving a good education for our kids so they can someday make a lot of money and have a better lifestyle than we had. Lord, that that not be our dream. And I don't believe it's a dream of most Christians here. But it could be some here. But Lord, also, us who know that you are more important than the things of this world, help us to be consistent in having our eyes on you. How many times we fail. We fail again and again, and we're so disappointed with ourselves. We're so disappointed knowing that we failed you. And the failure really was because we put our eyes, took our eyes off of you. We put our eyes on other things. We got so busy that we didn't meditate in you. We didn't have that default focus where every time we get done with the test, our mind and our heart snaps back to you, thinking of you. Lord, help us to realize how desperately we need you every moment of the day, every hour. Lord, I also pray if there's anyone here that does not know you, Lord, I think of that song that was sung of the joy and peace when we were in heaven with you. I believe there's probably somebody here that doesn't know about that joy and peace. They heard it sung here. Maybe they've come here several times. They've heard of the love and the joy and the peace, but they don't experience it because they have not received you as their Savior. They seem in the lives of the people around them, but they don't have it for themselves. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here like that, Lord, that they would realize that you love them. 2,000 years ago, you came to this earth and you died for them. You were beaten to the point where your body was broken. You shed their blood for them. And then you took their sins on your shoulders. The vile wicked sins, my vile wicked sins on your shoulders. Because of your love for them, that they would realize your love. They realize that they were the only person in the world, you would have died for them. And Lord, that they would tonight put their trust and faith in you, repent from their sins, and put their faith and trust in you. Lord, I pray if there's anyone like that tonight, Lord, that they would come to you. I pray these things in your name. Amen.